Hey everybody, it's Mike Johnson from PWInsider.com. I want to thank you very much for listening to this very special audio. As you know, earlier this week, Hurricane Harvey hit the Gulf Coast, specifically Houston, Texas, very hard. Uh, Lives have been ended, homes have been destroyed, families have been displaced. There is massive amounts of damage that they believe is going to cost in the hundreds of billions in order to replace. It is one of the greatest tragedies in the United States collective history. And one thing that we've talked about here on PW Insider on our different forums is how you can help and what you can do to donate. And today uh, we're sitting here with Mark Travinsky, who was the director of a film that came out a couple of years ago, At What Cost, which looks at the toll personally, professionally, emotionally, and spiritually professional wrestling takes on its performers, why performers get into the business, uh, why they continue to ply their trade when it does not go their way, uh, w- the toll that it has taken on them towards the latter end of their career. And it's an excellent documentary. Uh, Mark made the announcement yesterday that anyone who goes to the website for the film and purchases a download for the film or, or rents a download of the film uh, for a couple of days over, over the next week, he will donate 100% of the, of the the of the proceeds to... Hurricane Harvey relief. So I want to talk to Mark about that. We're going to talk about the film. We're going to talk a little bit about why Mark decided to do this. And we're going to talk some Hulk Hogan Celebrity Championship Wrestling, too. Because uh, Mark edited that that series, which I have, I have been on record in saying I'm very disappointed it never got a second season. And I'm very disappointed Todd Bridges got ripped off. But we'll talk about all that in a minute. Uh, first of all, sir, hi. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me on. All right. So I appreciate you doing this so early in the morning. I know it's very early in Los Angeles. We'll talk about the film in a second, but talk about why you made the decision to donate all the proceeds for anyone who decides to rent or download the film for the next week or so and make that donation to Houston. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a, far, it's a far-reaching situation. It's a sad situation. So beyond just, hey, good karma, uh, what made you decide to do this? Well, I was going to donate money anyways because I, I usually do, um, you know, I, I just feel, it's, you know, it's, you know, anybody with any sort of means um, – you know, even the littlest bit helps, you know. Uh, so I was going to donate money, and then I was like, hey, what if I can get you know, a, a decent amount of money? And, you know, my film is there. Um, I've been wanting people to see it anyways. I thought it was a good good way to reach out to the wrestling community again and say, hey, you know, you might not come out with a movie the first time. Here's a way to do something good and, you know, watch wrestling in the process. And you can say, hey... You know, I donated to the cause, and I got to watch a really good wrestling movie. So I thought it was a win-win for everybody. Now, for for those of you who haven't seen At What Cost, basically, over the course of, I think it was four years, right? Four years yeah. you did this? Yeah. Over the course yeah. of four years, Mark chronicled why, what profe- why professional wrestlers do what they do, and the toll that it takes on them personally, financially, spiritually, emotionally. And he went on the road with independent wrestlers who worked for Traditional Championship Wrestling, which was a group that ran in Arkansas and the Mid-South region, and reached out to a number of former WWE names, including Paul London, Brian Kendrick, Greg Valentine, uh, Jake Roberts, and a number of others. Um, So why don't we talk a a little bit about the film now? You were working as an editor um, in Hollywood. That's your full-time gig. You you edit TV and film. and. If I remember right, you were working on the aforementioned Celebrity Championship Wrestling, and out yeah, of that a, came the film, right? Yeah, that's what I was sitting in the bay with uh, Jason Hervey, and Jason Hervey was going on passionately about uh, you know wrestling, and you know he's a guy my age, and you know my first exposure to wrestling was WrestleMania one, um, and I was hooked for a number of years. But then I eventually grew out of it. Um, I was reintroduced uh, during the Attitude Era. My uh, friend uh, or my roommate in college was a big Goldberg fan, and uh, I got you know got to see where the business was then. Um, then uh, I ended up editing WSX uh, for for MTV with uh, for Kevin Kleinrock, and got to see where the you know where the moves were these days, you know, with Teddy Hart high flying and stuff, and I was just blown away from the progression. And when I was, you know, with you know, back to uh, Jason Hervey's program, you know, Jason talked about it with such passion. I was like, oh my god, that's a crazy documentary here. 
And, you know, I got back in, got to see, you know, um, you know I, uh, growing up, I never got to see live wrestling before because my father would never take me. So I actually, it wasn't until I started doing the movie that I actually saw my first live match, which was just a whole other level of coolness, as you well know. But, uh, no, it was, it was a great experience making the, uh, the movie. Um, you know, got to, got to call a lot of these guys my friends now. Um, you know, I see what, I see the passion in their eyes. I see, you know, I see the, uh, you know, what, you know, what it, obviously the dedication it takes to be, you know, to get to a top level. Uh, some guys have it, some guys don't. Um, so that's probably one of the problems with the business. But, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a journey for sure, um, and I think the product is pretty you know pretty good at the end. I think anybody anybody who loves wrestling will will uh, find find out something new in the documentary that they didn't know. Um, you know, and I, I, I think a lot of people won't admit to that, but uh, you know, and you know the casual fan will definitely you know love it. And even if you're not a wrestling, um, the ones that are really blown away by the business. But that was kind of what I was trying to do. I was trying to pull the line of uh, a super fan would still love it, and someone who knew nothing about it would also find it entertaining. So I think I accomplished that. So you embedded yourself for a couple of years, and yeah. uh, you know, obviously, I, I write about professional wrestling full time, so I kind of understand that mindset of what these guys go through and, and why they do it. But in your own words, why do you think? guys fall in love with the business to the point they give so much of themselves physically and emotionally and their entire lives wrestling comes before everything including their children at times talk about why you think guys men guys and women do make that decision and even when the money is not there or the fame isn't there and the success isn't there or the time has passed them by because everybody everything has a finite life sure why do they still place that place the business above everything else like you know like like i know people have made the comparison of it being a uh a, an addiction at times but like from someone who's come from the outside who was a fan diving into it from that perspective why do you think so many guys ha- place such a huge importance on pro wrestling even when it's not giving back to them well, um, obviously, I think that the adrenaline rush is there, you know, in the, in the live performance and the, uh, you know, playing for the crowd, you know, just just like an actor, you know, even if you do a, you're a big screen movie actor, they always like to go back to, the, you know, if you're a true actor, you like to go back to the small stage and, you know, have that intimacy with the fans, and I think that's, you know, what they what they get addicted to. I think they get addicted to, you know, being able to, uh, you know, uh, pull on people's heartstrings, you know, and uh, you know, control the crowd, you know, the, the good ones, obviously, um, you know, and, and it's just that, that need to be, you know, the focal point, um, you know, of, of attention and, um, you know, and, and there's the, there's the physicalness of it as well. And the, and the, the choreography, I mean, there's obviously the, you know, it's, uh, there's many facets to it, but, um, I think, I think the good ones that can really control the crowd and make them do whatever they want, you know, I think Rock Riddle was talking about, uh, you know, throw a name from the past. Um, was just talking about, you know, how he could just manipulate the crowd and just do whatever he wanted with them. And, and you know, he had it by the palm of their hands. And I think that's the, that's the, the draw that, uh, you know, really makes it. It's, yeah, the, the interaction with the fan, you know, I think is really what they, uh, what they're addicted to. Um, you know, so if there's no fans, you know, it's just practice. So. I, I think that's I think that's what I drew on um, as a non as a not, someone who never uh, got between the ropes. Um, I had you know difficult time identifying with some of these these independent guys that didn't. In my mind, they're probably just too small to ever make it in the WWE, which is you know the the real meal ticket for uh, any of these guys. But you know they they still they're still really good at their craft and you know they travel the world and I think that's you know that's another thing you know the, the good ones get to travel. Obviously, uh, some people's uh, definition of making it's just getting it to getting to Japan. So um, you know I guess I guess uh, to each their own and what their goals are. Um, but uh, yeah, I interviewed so many people it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly what one specific person you know uh, why why they're addicted to the sport that they love. 
there's a scene in the film where you're on the road with uh, Sigmund and uh, someone else. I forget the other wrestler's name from TCW. Shane Williams. Yeah, yes, Shane Williams. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, and you, you're on the road with them, and you go to this indie show. There's not even an apron on the mat. It's literally like the worst conditions possible. They've spent their money to get there. They've spent their money to be there. And the payoff is like, I think like 10 or $15. Yeah. Like, coming from a world where, you know, you work in film and, and, and at television, and, you know, there's good and bad to everything. But sure. certainly the performers especially are a little more catered to. And then seeing that world of independent wrestling, like, like, it, 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 was that a huge culture shock for you, or did you kind of know, based on what your knowledge of indie wrestling was, like what these guys were getting into and what you had to expect with that? I uh, so I, there was a level of expectation, and then there was that. Um, you know, we drove down from uh, Knoxville to Morristown, uh, about an hour drive. We ate lunch. Uh, we worked out. I actually uh, I filmed a movie back in two thousand five called Morristown it was a ballet love story. Um, so I actually took the, those guys to the ballet studio and put them through uh, some ballet classes. But uh, so we did that during the day, and then we went over to the the um, uh, I guess it was a I'm trying to think uh, some sort of war memorial, um, small small one. Um, but uh, just maybe sixty people showed up. Um, yeah, like you said, it wasn't, it wasn't very it wasn't the lux uh, in the. Uh, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It wasn't it wasn't the best setup, let's say. And yeah, I just I was I was shocked because uh, they you know they put on fifteen or you know fifteen to twenty minutes, uh, worked hard, and uh, you know it gets gets paid ten dollars. I had no idea what the payouts were. You know, you don't usually ask the the, the wrestlers what they're getting paid, but you know, the gas, the lunch. The dinner, you know, I, you know, they were lucky. I picked up the, the dinner tab that day, but um, <laughs> I just couldn't believe that they they do that. Like, and that's you know. But on the flip side, I need, you know, I went broke out here in Hollywood for about two years, begging to work on films for free, you know, um, just to just to get you know pay pay my dues, you know. And uh, I guess you all have to do it, but uh, it's it's a shame that there's so little payout for the, uh, the abuse that they put the bodies through. I, I had a, a similar moment to the one you talk about where I had gone to a Combat Zone wrestling show and somebody who had worked a Cage of Death match, which is their biggest show of the year, and it's always the biggest crowd of the year. And he did this crazy stunt where he went off the cage, threw one or two tables to the floor, no padding, and just talking to him afterwards, and I was like, you know, Nothing for nothing. You, you put yourself through a lot. I hope the payday was worth it. And he was like, 50 bucks. I was like, I'm like, like you know, my eyes kind of popped out like Ren from Ren and Stimpy for a second. And I've been around the business, you know, around writing about it since 1996 and full time since 2004. And I, even I was like, what the what? Like, are you kidding me? Like, why? What, no sane person does this. And But, you know. There's like there's and I admire the passion. I it sounds weird to use this term. I find it very romantic that they do this for their pursuit of their art and hopes of making major money down the line. But at times, I, I you know, to me, I, I look at it like, you know, fight or flight. And in my mind, hey, do this and potentially break your neck, break your back, die. And with $50 is waiting for you on the other side. Like, to me, that that's where the flight comes in. Like, okay, I'm not doing this. You know? And I, I, I'm always amazed at not the risks that guys will take physically, but emotionally and mentally what they're willing to do and those risks that they're willing to take to better themselves as wrestlers, but also to entertain, knowing that, hey, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, it's fool's gold. You have no idea. You know? Like, there's no guarantee. You're, like, now the big goal is, ah, oh, get to the performance center. Get to the Pro WWE Performance Center. There's no guarantee anyone who ever takes a bump in the ring will ever get to that Performance Center, much less the main roster. Because there are people who get to the Performance Center and flame out and never go anywhere else. But, it, it, you know, it's that pursuit of it. I, I, I respect it, but I'm also continually amazed by it, and I shake my head at it 
probably every week. Well, it, it it didn't make the movie, but I brought Paul London to tears. You know, I mean, I talked to him for about three hours, and you know, I mean, it was his whole goal to get to the WWE, and you know, he got there in pretty pretty uh, big fashion. You know, being uh, I think two or three time tag team champion. But as we all know, we got on Vince's bad side, you know, with the, the whole limo gag. And he didn't even have any idea what's going on, and Vince blackballed him, you know. And like so, like you know, when you put all that effort in to get to your dreams, and then um, and then you get the carpet ripped out from underneath you, then where do you go? Yeah. You know. So I mean, what happens when you've seen the pot of gold, and then you've taken you're taken away from it? So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a rough business, you know. And, I mean, and, and there's also uh, another element to that, which is. You know, I often use the Wizard of Oz as as my analogy, where you you've you've worked to get across the gold, the the yellow brick road to get to Emerald City. Well, then when you get there and you're in Emerald City, you realize it's not really green and it's not really all that great. And that's what happens to a lot of people when they work to get to WWE. They have this idealized version of what it is in their head, and then they get there and it's a completely different world. And and that that's yeah. that that's a mind you know that screws with people's minds as well is that I expected and you know and that's life nobody gets what they expect in life but I expected A and instead I'm getting F and you yeah. know it's and that and I think that that certainly breaks guys and women down emotionally and mentally too and hurts their drive at times. Yeah, Paul was saying you know he thought thought they'd all be friends once he got there. Like surely we all be friends, you know. And said nothing be farther from the truth. Like you know it's, you got guys you know. I, you know, hiding dr- drugs in uh, uh, you know coworkers' lockers and running to the front office, say, "Oh, so and so's on drugs," trying you know trying to get their roster spot, you know, and just just catty catty behavior, you know, or juvenile um, you know backstabbing and just you know it's uh, I mean it's all there, you know, and I, I guess it's just I, I, it's it's a uh, it's a shame, you know, um, but you know obviously obviously there's the, the risk is there, but uh, people are still willing to still want to go and find out for themselves, you know. So um, you know, I think they'll always keep the business going. Right. So I want to talk to you a little bit about um, editing pro wrestling. You mentioned okay. you 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 edited Wrestling Society X, which certainly uh, had its own little bells and whistles and some CGI thrown into it for different things, and like the bling on the ladders and and, <laughs> yeah. and light lightning bolts coming out of uh, fingertips, like. The Emperor and the Return of the Jedi, and you worked on Celebrity Championship Wrestling, which was, uh, I I actually sincerely loved Celebrity Championship Wrestling. I thought it was a fun reality show, and I think it should have been a bigger hit than it was. Um, Talk a little bit about editing wrestling, and is there a different eye for editing it versus editing a, a reality show? And now, obviously, with Celebrity Championship Wrestling, you know, that kind of fits into the reality genre as well. Um, but like, you know, when you're working on Wrestling Society X or any wrestling project, how different is that from going in and editing a Rock of Love or an, or a feature film? Um, well, you know, the, the straight up wrestling, I mean, besides the, um, you know, the little skits backstage or whatever, or, or uh, the promos, um, you know, it's just straight up, you know, just uh, looking for the best shot and, you know, trying to make, you know, the... The, the the bumps seem you know bigger than they are, but um, you know, but Hulk Hogan celebrity champion, you, you, you get Todd Bridges, man. I, I grew up on you know <laughs> different strokes, and you, know, you get Danny Bonaduce, and you got Rodman. Um, so that was very more like a uh, a traditional reality show, like Rock of Love, except for you know they're not trying to get time with Brett. Um, but uh, no, I. I Honestly, every every TV show I've I've done fifty TV shows to date. I think um, right now I'm cutting something for Snapchat. Like I, everything's everything's different but the same. Um, you know, you're all you're all just trying to tell the best story. Um, you know, story arcs and, and such like that. You know, if it's if it's just wrestling, obviously you know you, you start slow, you build up to something, you throw throw a few uh, false flags in there, and then you know you get the pin. But um, you know, you just, you just want you want to tell a compelling story no matter what you're cutting. And um, you know, I I did that uh, with both those wrestling shows. I think I did as my documentary, and I think I'm doing these little four minute Snapchat videos. I'm <laughs> I'm editing right now. But um, yeah, I, I, I like uh, wrestling or um, I'll, I'll, I'll the celebrity championship wrestling because they taught the difference of the uh, business. And I think the uh, uh, the art of the promo is one of the better 
was one of the better episodes in that. And uh, and also, I, I remember uh, this, this was it uh, showed up. Uh, our RVD showed up and uh, showed him how to do, do the uh, frog off the top of the rope, and Danny Bonaduce almost lost his mind. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the um, you know, the funny thing about that show is going in as you watch it the best wrestler in it is undoubtedly Todd Bridges. Like, he he got the physicality of it. You can see he had a a, a mindset for it. And obviously he had grown up being a wrestling fan. He mentioned that. I think he, like, name-checked the great Mephisto or something over the course of the show. And in the end, it ends up being Rodman. And I remember, like, the episode aired, and I had, like, eight people who complained, like, oh, the fix is in. And I'm like, it's a reality show about pro wrestling. What did you expect? <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, I really feel like that was, like, one of these shows that should have been more successful than it was. Maybe maybe the wrong network picked it up. I think it was on CMT. I don't know. Yeah, um, on CMT, yes. Yeah, so, you know, here, here's my question for you. When you start to edit this, because, you know, you've got 47 minutes of footage that you've got to have as your final product so that they can drop commercials in. Sure. Um, for one episode, how much time goes into curating, this is what we want to do, this is our story, and then culling down from the original content? Like, how, how uh, long does the uh, process usually take? And I know there's not an exact science. No, 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 there's not an exact time. Uh, a one-hour episode for one editor will take us probably about six weeks. So, wow. So. Um, and that's, you know, you usually get a rough cut out. Uh, you know, I think that one, that process probably went a little, little faster because there's actually wrestling and that doesn't take as much time as, uh, you know, uh, having dialogue, uh, and, and such, and there's no music. So that helps. So maybe that was a little faster, but generally the rule of thumb is, uh, you know, six weeks for an hour. Um, but, uh, you know, and it depends on how much you shoot. And then if you shoot a lot of stuff, then you have to have producers that go through all that footage and, you know, they pare it down for us, and then we, you know, we take what they've pared down, you know, as far as the story beats, and then put music to add emotion and, you know, hit the points, and then, you know, hard decisions have to get made, and it makes that 47 minutes or 48 minutes or 42 minutes, whatever the, uh, whatever the network uh, deems how many commercials they want. But so now- uh, it's... It's, it's a, it looks, I was say, it's, it's a fun process. Uh, it's a frustrating process. Um, you know, we, we'll get a rough cut out about, you know, three weeks, and then you just have to deal with the networks and the higher-ups, and they decide, you know, what what is good and, you know, or what's going to make the TV. I guess they don't decide what's good, but they decide what's going to make TV. So so now now when you're editing this, like let's say for the Hogan series, is mm-hmm. Bischoff in is Bischoff in the room or is Bisch, the, the like the dailies go to like in the film film industry the director will look at the dailies and say yay nay yeah. and and kind of guide the editor and then once the the first cut is done the, the director will go and, and 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 continue continuously shape the film until he gets whatever he and the studio are happy with releasing um, you know would a process like a reality show like that. Are the producers in your ear? Are, are do you do you have set instructions? Like I don't imagine Eric Bischoff sat in in the editing bay for hours he, on end as you were trying to. No, he wasn't there for hours. He, we, we would take a you know he would show up. Uh, Jason was in a little bit more than uh, Eric was. Um, the uh, actually I think the last time I saw Eric we were in an earthquake together. We uh, we were watching my episode and, and the whole building started to shake and um, and uh, we're like was that an earthquake and like yeah pretty much was and um but uh yeah he would show up when you had a a pretty good rough cut you know and then he would give his two cents and then you'd try and adjust it to those notes or you know what worked what didn't can we make that better you know basically what an executive producer does you know they don't they don't sit around and do all the heavy leg you know lifting they you know they wait until it's it's almost done and then they start giving their fine-tuned notes or how to know what's working what's not kind of thing so but, uh, yeah, he was around. Uh, I saw him quite a bit. So, uh, but uh, usually, always always at the tail end, never at the beginning. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit of Wrestling Society X, too, while I got you here. Because yep. sure. that series was so much better than it ever had a chance to show itself to be. Because the ratings were not strong right off the bat. And there was a changeover in management and MTV. 
um, and that kind of killed it almost really before it started. It was a lame duck show even before the first episode debuted. Talk about putting that together. You know, one of the stories of that show that we always hear the narrative is what the network wanted it to be versus what traditional wrestling is presented as in terms of how the matches were cut, in terms of how the stories were shown. Talk a little bit about being the guy in the in you know in the middle of that in the middle of the volley back and forth between the wrestling mindset and the network mindset and how you kind of balance that in editing cutting the show. Well, the the the, the first episode I I cut was uh, Teddy Hart and uh, M Dog Twenty against uh, God, I can't think of their name. Um, was it the Dragon, Dragon Gate guys? Dragon Gate, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, but that was, that was easy to cook. MTV wanted fast, you know, fast matches and high flying. That, that fitting in exactly what they wanted. But like my friend Lou, who goes back to cutting sound for Miami Vice, he got the, uh, he got the, the finale episode between, uh, Vampiro and, uh, Ben, Ben. Was it Sean Waltman? Well, Banderas or, uh, uh, Oh man, my, oh, Ricky Banderas with the, with Ricky the Banderas. coffin? Banderas, yeah, 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 yeah. So it was, yeah, Vampiro against Ricky Banderas. And, like, you know, like, well, and they just start slapping each other across the face for the first five minutes and, like, you know, really doing the dance. And Lou's like, how the heck am I supposed to cut this to, you know, to time? You know, and, uh, you know, he was losing his mind. Um, you know, uh, but, yeah, MTV, had, you know, they wanted the, the, they wanted the music. They wanted, was that, three, I think, three matches in a half hour. So that that was problematic. Um, they put it up at, at 9:30 at, on a Monday night, which we all know is problematic because uh, you know Raw has already started. Um, and I think at the time Wednesday didn't have any wrestling, so we couldn't understand why they do, they wouldn't put it on Wednesday night. It seemed like a no-brainer. Six days of wrestling. We had the seventh product. Put it on Wednesday, but they wanted a lead-in of Friday Night Lights or something like that or some. Some stupid show that thought that you know would get their you know suits. Man, I don't, I don't know. That's just that's, that's my bottom line. I just go suits because it's they you know people just. I've had many a show is ruined by just timing. Um, you know, I yeah, it's, it's a frustrating part about our business. You know, I've, the shows I'm really passionate about, the ones I really like, are the ones that do the worst. It was business. The uh, the suits are always the ones <laughs> to make the bad decisions. I think I've, I've rarely done a note from the network that uh, said, "Oh, that makes the show better." Um, but it's you know it's uh, ultimately their show and that's going on yeah. and what they choose to do with it uh, you know is their business. But uh, you know, Wrestling Society X could have gone multiple seasons if they put it on the right night. Um, you know, I, I did a, a show uh, with this, this mentalist named Keith Berry, uh, who, who would, you know, mess with people's minds and, and destroy that one too. You know, I was like, these are the shows I'm passionate about. Like, it's like, oh, I love working on this show, and then it gets, you know, finds finds its audience. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, you know, this is coming from a guy that did, you know, like ten seasons of of love shows. So. Well, yeah, who I, knows what people want? <laughs> we 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 can. I I I I have said many a times. I think the Flavor of Love was one of the greatest shows of all time, just because it was yes. just amazing. And I wish it had gone on even longer. We could talk about that another time, though. And I invite you to come back anytime you want. I know we're running yep. low on time. Um, let everybody know where they can track down the documentary and um. And uh, why they should uh, obviously beyond the good karma here, why you feel they should go out and check it out. Um, the easiest way for me is just, uh, you can go to my website, which is, uh, at what cost the film dot com. Um, there you get to some, some, besides the film, there, there's a link to the film there. It's on Vimeo, which I don't know the direct link. That's something I'm going to send you to my website. Um, but the film's on Vimeo and you can, uh, rent it for 72 hours for three ninety nine, or buy it for nine ninety nine and own it and show all your friends. Um, but uh, the website's got some cool T-shirts and posters and, and such like that. But um, I, I just think that any wrestling fan, um, I think every wrestling fan should see it. Um, I think it's, I think they'll be pleasantly surprised with some information they didn't know. Um, I think it's a great way to help out, uh, you know, the hurricane victims. Uh, I mean, we all seen the images. It's pretty, pretty horrific down there. And I don't see, uh, 
end in sight for for many months. No, it's going to be uh, so yeah. long. It's going to take so long to fix yeah. this. But you know, you can watch a wrestling documentary and then tell all your friends you helped out the uh, hurricane victims. I mean, it's a win-win. So uh, you know, it doesn't cost you much, and uh, you can feel good about yourself. So that's that was that was why I got that's why I started to do it, and uh, hopefully we can raise a lot of money for them, and uh, you know, we can come back on the site and talk about how much money we raised. All right, well let's uh, let's do that soon, and uh, everyone can check it out. We'll have links right under the audio, and uh, we thank everybody for listening. But most importantly, uh, our best hopes and wishes to everybody in the Houston area. And this is a way you can help them out, and also watch a really good, compelling documentary about pro wrestling, which we all love, which is why we're all here talking about it. So, uh, Mark, I want to thank you for sitting down with us and talking to us and giving us some time. I hope to get you back on here again at some point. Uh, I would love to have a whole dissertation on the flavor of love. Um, sincerely, we can do that. <laughs> sincerely, <laughs> that and I don't, I'm, I'm not being facetious, loved that show. Just an incredibly yeah. entertaining show. Um, all three seasons, and even some of the spinoffs I enjoyed, too. Um, yeah. No, I got, I got to meet Flavor Flavor. It's pretty, pretty uh, high on my list of things I've done. <laughs> I've said it before, national treasure. He is a national yeah. treasure. Um, so I want to thank everybody for their support of PW Insider, and if you're listening... Uh, no matter how you're listening to this, we thank you for checking it out. Most importantly, check out At What Cost, and um, you can help out the victims of Hurricane Harvey by doing so. So, again, I'm Mike Johnson. Thank you so much for listening. Mark, I want to thank you so much for your time and for uh, the good karma you're putting out there in the world, sir, and uh, a great documentary as well. Thank you very much. All right, everybody. Until next time, I'm Mike Johnson. Take care, and thank you for your support.